Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much, Jose. Thanks, Ahmad. It's so wonderful to be here uh, with all of you from all over the world to share our story about how we are implementing a variety of lean concepts within our company, Procore Technologies. And it's, uh, it's just great to, to be here and to see everybody um, saying hello in the chat. And uh, just wanna say welcome. And again, thanks for coming. And so Tim and I work at a company called Procore Technologies. We're practitioners. So we're telling you our story about how we diffuse lean and agile techniques across our R&D organization. And Procore is a company with a, 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 with a vision to improve the lives of people in construction all over the world. We're a global company. And our mission is to connect everyone to a global platform and improve the way everyone communicates together across all the different roles in construction. And so we, our software has tools like visualizing job sites. This is a BIM oriented tool, which allows you to see a 3D model of something you're going to build before you build it. So we have also have innovative ways to work with 2D plans on your mobile devices in the job site or from anywhere, really. And so we're really proud to support people in construction and help everybody um, make best use of digital technologies. So our software, here's something that Tim worked on. Um, our software is software as a service and it, we offer a variety of tools from project management, accounting tools, safety tools, drawing tools, as I mentioned, and more. And so the company is uh, very proud to work at Procore. And like other companies, like many companies, like many people, there's a lot to do, there's a lot to focus on. Like, where do we start? How do we focus and build what's right for our customers? Well, we have a variety of techniques uh, that we've mastered in our company to have the right focus and to go in the same direction. But like many of you, a lot of the times there's so much to do and we have a lot of work in process, right? And so it's kind of like things are coming really fast and it's really not sustainable to work like this. You know, this is an old video from an I Love Lucy show where they're working in this candy factory and everything is coming so fast that they're doing whatever they can to move things along. Well, that's really no way to work. And so we really um, like to uh, promote ideas that, that, that in insist people have more of a sustainable pace. And you know, we think that sustainable development is the way to go. We have a lot, we wanna have, have lives and have health. And so we work in a sustainable pace. So, you know, like everybody else, we have customers that are looking for our features, they're looking for our developments. We're looking, and, and we have to be able to answer this question, when will it be done? We have to be able to answer this internally. We have to be able to answer it externally. I've been in the software and uh, software industry for 20 years. For many years, there's a variety of techniques that we've used, including estimation, to try to get at this answer, when is it going to be done? Some of us might look at velocity and story points. And you know, there's, there's other techniques that we've learned that help teams get better at answering the question, when, when will it be done? And I just have to say mad props to our friend and mentor and teacher here, Dan Vacanti. At one point, we learned that he had new techniques developed from uh, the history of Kanban uh, that he learned while at Corbis in Seattle. So he was at the beginning of the Kanban movement and has a variety of tools and techniques that we found very interesting. So we became students of this. And we desired to master techniques uh, leveraging lean about how can we best answer this question? When will it be done? And again, we've experimented with other techniques in the past, like estimating with story points, for example. But as Dan likes to say, when somebody asks you, when will it be done? You don't tell them seven points. You need to have a different answer. And you need to have a way to get to that answer that has respect for the people and that really kind of encourages working at a sustainable pace. And so what did we do? So we knew that we wanted to encourage lowering work in process for one, and that we wanted to start an initiative within our company. This is an example of a template we used to start a dialogue about bringing a consultant in, bringing Dan in, for example, 
to give us an initial training session. Although Tim and I have been in the industry for, for many years, these were techniques and tools that we had maybe heard of, but we wanted to dig deeper. We wanted that expertise to come in with the idea that if we can master this and we can get good at this, then we can diffuse it across our company. We can help get better at answering that question. When will it be done? We'll get closer to achieving our vision of improving everybody's lives in construction. So this is like a general template that we used where, you know, we talked about the problem we were trying to solve. You know, this is an internal tool that we use to try to get the funding, for example, to bring the consultant in. And I think it's important to share practitioner tools like this. Um, I, I found it very helpful. So what problem are we trying to solve? Well, we've got a lot of work in process and we want to encourage techniques to lower them. And we found um, these ideas that we'd like to experiment with. But the first step is that we need to learn about it from this expert. So anyway, uh, this is the general format that we used. Now, over to you, Tim. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, I'm Tim. I'm a software architect at Procore Technologies. Um, let's, let's take a step backwards for a second. Where did we come up with this idea? And who are we going to recruit to join us on this journey? We saw the one pager talking about recruiting squads. Well, this whole thing started actually uh, shortly after I joined Procore. Heidi had put together an operational excellence event where we took all of R&D um, offline for three days and we talked about what we thought were the most important things we could focus on as an organization. I chose technical debt and mine was chosen as the number one crowdsourced initiative. And uh, I'm coming up on a quarter century in the software industry. And so I've seen a few things here and there. And it's been my experience that the number one culprit for unconsolidated technical debt is an unsustainable process. If teams are constantly scrambling to the finish line, they're likely to cut corners and very unlikely to go back and address those after the fact. Even the term sprint itself is somewhat troublesome. If teams are constantly sprinting, when do they ever have time to recover and rest? So I started teaching uh, some in-house sessions at Procore on sustainable development tips, things like reducing WIP, um, you know, shifting testing earlier to the process and getting better at estimating and forecasting. Heidi sat in on a few of these and she introduced me to Dan's book, Actionable uh, Agile Analytics for Predictability. And the ideas really clicked with me. You know, as an engineer, the mathematics behind it in particular really clicked. Um, but I started incorporating that into the sessions and Heidi and I talked about it a little further and she suggested that we actually reach out to Dan and bring him on site um, and run some workshops with teams. So of course, who were we going to recruit? Well, we went and talked to the teams that had been through the sustainable development sessions. And not surprisingly, since they had already volunteered for those sessions, they were pretty hungry for this stuff. And uh, so we were able to do this. We convinced leadership to bring Dan on site and we did you know, a full two day session with three squads. And it was really successful. I think because the teams were so hungry for this, they had a problem and were looking for solutions. And so we actually got some really good results from this. Not all of the teams were able to lean in 100%, but one in particular really got something from this. And we have this great testimonial from one of our engineering managers on that team. And the basic gist of it was they didn't stop doing the estimating that they had been doing, but now they had greater confidence and they could see that these techniques might reduce the need for estimation going forward. So from there, word spread. You know, people were very curious, what is this thing that Tim and Heidi are, are trying to push and, and can our team get in on it as well? So we, you know, had the bright idea to uh, try and bring Dan back. We made a pitch to leadership that, uh, you know, we know we've already spent the money to bring him on site once, but people are clamoring for this. People have a real desire and we'd like to bring Dan back uh, and do this a little bit more formally. Well, at this point, Heidi and I were really excited about this. You know, we not only did we feel that the ideas themselves were sensible and represented one of the best approaches that we've seen in our careers, um, but also, you know, people were excited about it. And what we had seen so far was really paying off. So we got so excited and you know, with Procore being, at least at the time, still quite flat in terms of hierarchy, we took it all the way to the top. Um, we went to our president, Mr. Steve Zahm, who is very much a data-driven decision-making type of character. One of his favorite quotes is, the data is the data. So we managed to get a, a half-hour session with him, which turned into an hour, where we presented what we were trying to achieve. And, you know, Steve was on board. I think he is detached from the day-to-day, -day, but was very excited about us constantly trying to improve what was happening in the trenches. 
But we may have gotten a little carried away. Uh, we got so excited that we may have forgotten to bring the right people along on our journey. And so we had to take it uh, back to those people, including my boss. Heidi? Yeah, so we uh, talked to Ani, and she's a wonderful uh, SVP in engineering. And um, this is what she said to us. Well, this all sounds pretty good, but I need you to prove it to me. And we looked at each other and we were kind of like, well, okay, we'll prove it. We'll put together an experiment. And so we decided to get all of our best tactics and techniques. And we actually wrote out a formal experiment that we would run if we brought Dan back. Here's what we do, what we would do. And here's how we're going to try to see if this stuff works or not. We were already convinced, we had a hunch, we had this early success with our first, uh, after the first time he came, we called it like that, like our pilot. And it really warranted this further experimentation. She really challenged us to really kind of dig in and show her how this stuff really works. And, and that was excellent leadership because she really, really challenged us to work harder. These are some of the hypotheses that we sought to test in our experiment. And this took, started in about October of last year. So we thought that if, this, we had the hunch that if we would get deeper into these tools, that cycle time variability would be reduced. That our whip, that our whip, our work in process or work in progress would be reduced and that the flow efficiency would be improved. Maybe we'd have less delays. So these, this is what we focused on. This is what we kind of wrote down as our hypotheses. And then we came up with this long list of things we thought should happen. And as you can see, and we don't expect you to read this whole thing, we, we expected way too much of our squads that were participating in our experiment. So how did it go? Well, the first thing that we found, um, it, it didn't go swimmingly. We did have a few road, road bumps, uh, speed bumps in the road. And the first thing that we found was that, uh, you know, people's data needed cleaning up. So um, there's nothing quite like visualizing your data to give you a sense of, of how it is. Uh, you know, a system is only as good as what you put into it. And so the first thing that we had to do with teams was to clean up their data. We found that the most common problem that teams had was, um, a st workflow status the team thought considered to be done that wasn't mapped to a workflow stage of done. And so technically those tickets were still in progress. So when we brought up their aging work in progress charts, some teams had tickets that were in like this one, 384 days old uh, over a year. And so you can see this great big spike here in November where they went and did just that. They cleaned that all up. They either removed those tickets or uh, mapped them to an appropriate workflow stage. We also found that um, in this particular instance, we had gotten buy-in. We wanted to spread this to a broader uh, spectrum of people. So we brought just a small group of people from uh, multiple squads, from 10 different squads. And um, they then went back to their squads, very excited about this. And the squads themselves were not bought in because they hadn't been through the training. And so what ended up happening is after a brief period of practicing us, they fell back into old habits, like comfortable old shoes even when those habits were not necessarily serving them, it's human nature. And we also scheduled this right before the holidays. So it was just a month before Thanksgiving here in the United States, and then very quickly the winter holidays uh, were on us. And so it did affect our metrics a little bit and our timing and our engagement with squads. But nonetheless, um, we did get some results from this. And the results, at first we were a little naive in examining the data. Um, you can see here, these, two, these are two side-by-side -side cycle time scatter plots. I'm not going to go too much into the details of what's here, but that green line in each one is the stability. It's showing the 85th percentile, or 85% of the time, this is how long it takes for a ticket to be completed. And so it's pretty clear from this picture that it's wildly variable on the left before and reasonably stable afterwards. However, this was kind of a naive comparison because on the left hand, we have the entire history of time since the beginning of this team's uh, start. And on the right, just two months of the experiment. So it was pretty clear that we were actually just comparing apples to oranges and that we needed to be a bit more realistic in controlling that data. So we went back and we took for each team a sample of roughly the same amount of time before, about two months, and the two months of the experiment window. And still, 
we can see. If we go back and forth between these, we can see quite a bit of variability in that cycle time trend line in the two months prior to them cleaning up their data and starting with this experiment and a reasonably stable cycle time trend line afterwards. And it turns out that this played out across most of the squads. We looked at cycle time primarily in terms of stability. Uh, because we know that we had some stale data that was artificially inflating cycle times. So in other words, if we had tickets that were technically, as far as JIRA is concerned, open for a year, um, that cycle time is artificially inflated. So we're more interested in can they stabilize it? And what we saw was that for four out of the five squads that actively practiced the techniques uh, that we suggested, uh, they had a significant decrease in the range of cycle time or their cycle times stabilized, much as we hypothesize. And even with the caveat of the bad data, we also saw that two squads had a fairly significant decrease in overall cycle time. So that was one hypothesis we felt was confirmed. Then we looked at WIP. We wanted to see if teams had reduced their WIP. And again, we have a caveat in that the data um, is artificially inflated. If we have a bunch of orphan tickets that are technically still in progress, we know that that WIP limit is greatly exaggerated. So even though four of the five squads had a decrease in WIP, and in some cases fairly significant, we also looked at the range. We wanted to see if they were taking on roughly the same amount of WIP from sprint to sprint. And for three out of those five, they had a reduced range in WIP as well, which means that the, the delta between the most WIP that they took on and the least WIP uh, was reduced. And then lastly, we looked at, uh, we jumped ahead there, sorry about that. Lastly, we looked at um, flow efficiency. Flow efficiency is a ratio of the time actively spent working on items over the entire lapse time. So this accounts for queuing and looks at you know, workflow stages where no work is, is happening because that's usually where you can make the biggest impact, the biggest return on investment. And what we saw was that for three of the five squads, they had a noticeable increase in flow efficiency. So it looked to us at least as if our three hypotheses were confirmed by the study. So Heidi and I were pumped. At this point, you know, we had a hunch and we thought we understood the techniques that Dan was championing here. And it seemed, at least to us, that our experiment had confirmed these hypotheses. And so we took it back to my boss. Yes, we took it back to Ani. And um, I think we were really excited. And, and, and again, we were really excited to, to work together to further this effort. Um, she uh, had some healthy skepticism as well at this point, which again, I think is a gift. Um, I think one of the things that she noted that you might have noticed as well is that our sample size is relatively small. We are a learning organization though, and I think that's one part of this that we are experimenting and learning how to get better. We are experimenting and learning with different techniques. And I think it was just enough for her to enable us to go forward and to say, yes, we'd like to kind of continue with this. You've uh, showed me enough for me to give you kind of the go ahead to continue to pursue this stuff. And so we took a moment and I think we were both uh, really excited that um, we'd come this far. And none of this is easy. It takes effort and it takes intention. And you know, we're just, we're trying to make a difference and we're trying you know, just to focus and care. So what did make the biggest difference? Like if we look back, like what were the quick wins? What were the things that really kind of stood out as impactful? Uh, to the effectiveness of our squads and to the ability to get towards that stable cycle time. Well, and how does it relate to this? So Accelerate is a book that many of you have probably heard of. It's a book that we recommend. And one of the big takeaways is that if you can see it, you can improve it. It's really important to visualize your work. I think in older traditions that I've heard about that always meant, well, stick your cards on a wall. Well, many of us don't have the luxury to be in the same room, let alone even have a wall <laughs> in an open workspace. Um, but uh, we have learned that if you can see your flow, it's the first step at improving it. And we can use these techniques. Again, we were using, it's implied here, a plugin that connects into JIRA at, that Dan created, Actionable Agile. And so we're using what we have in order to see better what is going on. 
aging tickets. So being able at a stand-up to have a stand-up with the goal of moving work along, identifying blockages, you need to look at aging tickets and stand-up. This was a very like the easiest practice for our squads to adopt after they got their data showing up properly in the tool. And so from right to left, from top to bottom, in the stand-up, you talk about these blue dots. Now those blue dots, if you click on them, you can see the actual ticket that's going through your JIRA workflow. And you could talk and you can take action about how to move that item forward. And I really like this because, um, in many traditions of having stand-ups, if you have a really open meeting format, what did I do yesterday? What am I gonna do today? What are the blocking issues? Some of us become zombies and it's like, you're just waking up if you have it first day in the morning. If you're not looking at your tickets, you're not looking at, at your aging, you might focus on things that really don't make an impact to remove um, blockages. For example, if we only talked about the tickets here in green, now there might be something to learn from that, that's true. But if we want the outcome of our standup to focus on uh, acting on our flow and moving things along, we talk about the aging. It also lowers the uh, cycle time when you do this. So, you know, we came at a crossroads here. Do we wanna just take the easy way, let things just see how they play out, maybe give a talk, maybe do a random workshop, see how it goes? No, we feel like we need to deliberately try to continue and sustain what we've done so far, and that there are better ways of working, and they take effort to shift over to them. And as people that are helping our company succeed, you know, we got a big mission and a big mission, big vision at Procore to improve the lives of everyone in construction. This is how we play a part in helping our company achieve that vision. So. So, but we still have quite a bit of work ahead of us. Um, you know, what we showed from the results of our limited study was that we were able to get these teams uh, cycle time stable. And that's probably the most important thing that we can do to start with. Um, you know, as Dan says, if your process isn't stable, it can't be predictable. Uh, but in the case of say this team, if we look at those teams after cycle time, this is in during the two months of the, of the experiment window, that line's pretty stable. The delta between the max and min uh, is fairly stable. But if we take some context here, this particular team is working using the scrum methodology and they're working in two week sprints. And what we can see here, if we look at the cycle time uh, trend lines, is that their 85th percentile is 30 days. The 85th percentile means that once a ticket started, 85% of the time, it takes 30 days or less to complete. So obviously there's some room for improvement here. If this team wants to you know, complete most of their stories within their two week sprint uh, cycle, uh, they've got some work to do in reducing that cycle time. And that means they need to lean into reducing WIP and if possible, also reducing the story size, individual story size, keep it closer to trunk-based development. Nonetheless, um, this team is stable and stability is the most important thing we're shooting for first because it sets us up for some really interesting discussions. What we're looking at here is a cumulative flow diagram. I'm not gonna go into the specifics. Suffice it to say, it is a very useful tool, especially as it's presented in Actionable Agile with some additional features you usually don't get from the, the basic JIRA. But what's really important here, and it's pretty easy to sum up, it shows these two lines, these two parallel lines, one on top of the other. The top one is the input rate. So that's the rate at which uh, tickets are arriving into this team's process. And the bottom is the throughput rate. That's the rate at which things are departing their process. And what's really interesting and excellent about this particular relationship is that they are exactly parallel. Their items are arriving at exactly the same rate they're moving. That's like nirvana from a predictability standpoint. And what it really does is it sets the stage for what we're aiming for for teams, which is Monte Carlo based forecasting, the ability to answer the question, when will it be done in terms of probabilities and ranges with high confidence. So how can we sustain this? Where do we go from here? Well, you know, we have a lot of squads. I think uh, in our company has been growing. And it's really hard to get something started. How do you know if the direction is continuing with that squad that you work with? We did learn between our pilot and our experiment that we need to teach the whole squad these techniques together so that we don't put like a point person 
in a change situation where they have to go back and convince their squads that and educate their squads on these techniques. So we knew that we had to like focus on the whole squads. That was a really cool learning that we had um, because when we started the second experiment, we thought we'll get broader reach. We'll just have, have triads, groups of people from each of the squads and then we'll impact more squads because our vision is that we you know, do this across our R&D our, our organization. But we learned that, no, you gotta focus on the squad as a unit. These things guide your coaching, these techniques. So here's just some of the list of what we're working on. We also learned that we need local ownership. There's only two of us. We've got a vast uh, organization. We need local ownership. And so we're partnering with engineering managers to really own these techniques and to coach locally. And we also are partnering with them to co-train the squads. And so our goal is to continue to support and train these local coaches to be with the squads and to encourage cycle time stability so that you can build on that later with more advanced techniques. We also learned, I think a really important lesson in that, like a two day workshop packed full of everything Kanban that you might wanna do from now and to eternity is really hard to, to soak in and have kind of keep with you. We have found that if we do shorter sessions internally, maybe a couple hours at a time, we can lead squads through a path that we think has a greater chance of sticking. So the tech, some of the techniques uh, to roll out gradually. So we, we do use a work in progress game that Dan created called TWIG, where we introduce squads to the concept of if you lower the work that you have in process, then stuff just travels through at a better rate. It's an interactive game. We have a two hour session with squads on that. Uh, we also, it, we teach squads how to get their data visualized within Actionable Agile, help them clean out any kind of uh, bad data so we know that they're off to the right start. And then we teach them the technique of how to have a more effective standup by looking at the aging work in progress in your standup. Then we emphasize using the cycle time scatter plots in retrospectives. That could be another separate, uh, you know, one to two hour session. And uh, then when we, uh, when the, when the, when partnering with the engineering managers and they have attained a stable cycle time, they can use that data for forecasting. So at that point, we come back and we train with further techniques for forecasting. So it's kind of a phased approach here. And then we can, some, the Monte Carlo estimation is for estimating uh, multiple items together. Like if you, if you know that you are working on this epic that, that right now today has 20 stories, you can use this tool for forecasting when it might be done. Or maybe you have a particular interest in trying to understand when a single item might be done. So you can leverage uh, some of the things we talked about today. You know, 85% of the time stories take five days or less to complete, you can leverage those kind of concepts as well. So with these techniques, I think we really feel that we've, um, this is the strategy that we wanna use as a default for answering the question, when will it be done? So I think we're at the point where we can entertain some questions. Jose, that was a half okay. hour, not bad. That's half an hour, excellent yeah. timing. So <laughs> Over the uh, last uh, the session, you have been um, been asking some questions in the Q and A button. If you haven't found the button, yes, it's a, it should be at the bottom of your navigation bar. It says Q and A. So there's a few questions already. Um, if you want to add questions, please do so, and or uh, you can also upload those questions which are most interesting to you. You would like to hear answers. So. While uh, I'm gonna just give you like about a minute to have a quick look. There is a few questions, I have a few ad boats. So within a minute, I will, we will start um, just passing on some questions. So just a minute.
please put the questions on the Q&A, not on the chat. Okay, so let's start with one question. Um, it should be, that's, that's a fairly simple question to both of you. Um, it's a question by Dylan Weyer. And the question is, how do you get teams to care about these metrics? Quite simple. Um, yeah, I mean, with that one, like when we started this whole thing, um, we knew that some squads had the challenge of how can we get better at forecasting? And so we were able to identify people that had this problem, that wanted to get better at it, that needed to get better at it. And so we start with the willing. We start with the people who have the, the, the challenge and want to learn tools and techniques to get better at it. And we also, I think, respected traditions. Like, if you estimate, that's fine. That's, you can keep doing that. If you like story points, whatever, just do it. That's another strategy. Um, we, we weren't in the in the in the mindset like this is better than that just do this one we respect your history and what you do just keep doing that this is another thing you can do and these techniques are pretty cool and here's how so we start with the people that are willing and i and then you know seriously i think for a year now since uh, dan came the first time i think it was about a year ago i think it was march of last year um, we've just been fielding demand of uh, people that want to learn these techniques. And now we're on the cusp of shifting over. We have a lot of opinion leaders. We have a lot of engineers, engineering managers, quality assurance, lots of different individual contributors who have taught each other how to use these tools and techniques to a certain degree. And so we really kind of are, are, are trying to, you know, kind of keep that kind of thing going. Yeah, we were fortunate enough in the early stages to have one team uh, that was particularly under the gun. They had a very high profile client who was quite demanding and it was made clear that they needed to provide as accurate estimation and forecasting as possible. So they had a very you know, high profile, very high pressure situation where they needed to be confident and credible in their forecasting. And that was actually the engineering manager whose testimonial we saw. The thing that has really been sort of a wind in our sails recently is that the organization is pivoting to look at key performance indicators and to look at, you know, how do we know how long it takes to get things done? And so this is a great tool in the trenches where there is now accountability being asked of, by the organization of team to be able to credibly and when will it be done and how long does it take? And we are now uh, you know, poised to give them an easy to use set of tools to do so. Cool. Excellent. So let's go to the next question. It's by Andrew Flannery. Um, are the metrics changes behaviors? So did you see any bad behaviors coming out of this? Something like gaming the systems? I mean, um, they said that you put the metrics, someone is going to game the system anyway. So what's your experience? I, I think the focus, you know, although the title of this, I think, mentions metrics, I think more of the focus is how can we be more effective in how we work? How can we have a stable flow that we can use later when somebody needs to know when it's going to be done? So the conversation is a bit different. And it's also, as Tim mentioned earlier, about developing at a sustainable pace. So you don't, you know, as one way, as one strategy to kind of uh, lower the creation of new technical debt. So the conversation is a bit different, but. Yeah, I think ahead, we've Tim. also really tried to encourage uh, holistic ownership of this by teams. So in other words, if only one person cares about it, um, others on the team may try to game the system, but if everybody is bought in and trying to understand how their work progresses, you're probably likely to have more accountability at the team level, co-ownership of this process, and you're less likely to have individuals gaming the system. But it, it is absolutely a concern and something that we will have to watch out for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I make a, a point about this, uh, recently I was um, watching a session by Chris Matz and what he, one thing that he said was, people are going to try to game the system anyway, so make sure that when they game it, they game it, to, they game it in such a way that they do the behaviors that you're looking for, mm -hmm. because they're going to game it anyway. It's human nature. Also, one so of the, was the, one of the really, thing. sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, one of the really interesting things too, and it's a point that Dan makes over and over again, is by looking at uh, ranges and probabilities, the, uh, you know, any one individual that tries to game the system, the, those metrics will not skew the remaining percentiles. And you can actually demonstrate that with the tool by zooming in and, and excluding the outliers, and you still see mm -hmm. that the trend line is relatively unaffected. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, so we can go to the next one. It's by um, Elaine Titanegro. And uh, she's asking, like, how did you measure queuing time for flow efficiency formula? So that is actually uh, something that's configurable uh, for teams. So the flow efficiency chart allows you to identify what are the what your team considers to be queuing stages. So um, mm -hmm. that is very much up to the team. What you know, I think for us here at Procore. Uh, the primary queuing stage would be ready for testing. We have most teams have a stage that's ready for testing. So when something exits code review, it's basically into a push workflow stage and then QAs pull from there when they're ready. And that becomes the primary queuing stage. Um, in Kanban, for example, there's often an active and done for each of the meta workflow stages. And that done stage would, would usually be marked as, as queuing where it's waiting for work to happen. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, Stuart Gibbons, next one. That's a long one. Um, at what step in the team's process did you start measuring cycle time, particularly if using, oh, using, they were using Scrum, especially, especially if they were using Scrum, I guess, um, at the start of a sprint or also including a pre-sprint, uh, where you include also the pre-sprint refinement activities? or even before that. So at which, at which point did you start um, measuring? Like where was cycle? the start point and where was like, mm -hmm. like what kind of, I think yes. it's typically yeah. it's like when something start in our organization, this is a conversation that we have with the squads that, that we're working with. And it typically starts with the in process and to deployed. Mm -hmm. um, but you could, yeah, you, and it, you could move that. You could, if you want to include discovery in it, you can, but we, I think primarily we don't, Go ahead, Tim. You're about it, to it's up to teams. So the way that Actionable Agile works as a plugin with Jira is that it will measure cycle time based on um, a well-defined workflow stage that team identifies as having started and a well-defined workflow stage the team identifies as being done. So you can configure, and let's say, for example, you have an analysis or a ready, ready for development but not started yet, you can exclude that from mm -hmm. the configuration of the tool. And that way it will not be have considered, it will not have considered to be started until you move it into your first started uh, workflow stage. And it, as soon as it moves into that stage, let's say you have ready for development and then in development, and you consider in development to have started, it will start tracking cycle time from there until whatever workflow stage you consider to be done. So that is, that is up to the team. That is up yeah. to the team. I think one of the things that we're seeing more and more is more teams visualizing their discovery, right? Uh, so it's kind of like you could talk like theoretically about, well, what should we visualize? What should we measure? What should we look at, right? I think you can have more inclusive software development if you visualize the discovery, the things that happen before something is ready to go. Um, in pro in progress and be worked on at the same and mm -hmm. in, in the same lines after something gets deployed what happened did we actually work on the thing that made a difference did we provide that value um, that's another dimension to this that's not included when you optimize for flow but are we building the right thing and it's important to kind of in the coaching come I'm at these things in multiple angles after we deployed mm -hmm. How, what's the feedback from the customer? How did it go? Were we actually successful, right? So there's ways I think we're looking right here, but we'll, it'll it'll take a step to kind of look broader when we get there, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is really a journey. And I guess as well, because every team is gonna have different definitions of workflow and different starting and end points, mm -hmm. visualizing them and communicating those points is gonna be quite important to avoid yeah. any sort of like um, confusion, misunderstandings, all those things. Yeah, and I think also, you know, a lot of the ways that we're coaching these techniques as they're, they're tools for teams mm -hmm. to look at what's going on and to visualize their own work and how can they try experiments in order to get their line more stable, for example. So it's Absolutely. like tools for the team to get better. And that's really the emphasis as opposed to 
all right, I got 50 teams and let's look at the cycle times and compare the, the squads. That's, that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're going for. It's more about empowering the teams. Like we've got these tools and techniques that we recommend when you're trying to answer the question, when will it be done? We'd love to teach them to you and kind of going from there. Indeed. Okay, let's go to the next one. So it's by, by Harun Khalil. Hi, Harun. Um, so what's the best way to discuss flow metrics versus story points with senior management? <laughs> that's, a, that's a wonderful question. Um, that's one for you, too. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, <laughs> I, you know I think, I think, um, I, so I think that certainly if, you, if we talk about story points, I, I believe story points have no value outside the team. And, and, and I say that because a story point is very specific to a team that uses them. If, if you choose to use story points, they are an internal language of relative complexity. And they're really helpful for deciding whether or not something can be done in some period of time you know, without having to go deep on it. Um, beyond that, it's like you know comparing apples to oranges because one team story point is going to be very different from another, and it doesn't really you're not delivering to customers story points, right? I mean, if you want to talk about value um, or even time estimates, so the you know the way that we have communicated this is that it is um, the whole idea is that it, it is agnostic of story points. It's agnostic of how big or small or complex any one story is. It's more looking at the aggregate and looking at how teams actually deliver. What is their throughput over time? And then being mm -hmm. able to make uh, predictions, credible predictions on that, right? And, and more importantly, because the data is already being captured for you in JIRA, assuming the teams are using JIRA correctly, they can reforecast frequently. And that allows you to take into account, you know, the inherent, um, the inherent uh, changes in your process. So, uh, you know, there's people getting sick and going out on vacation and there's holidays and weekends and all of these things. And ultimately our customers don't care. They're looking for calendar days. And when things happen, you know, if you have a, an estimation at a fixed point in time, let's say story points or worse, actual exact dates, when things change, those estimates are no longer valid. You have to re-estimate if you want them to be accurate. One of the real leverage points of this is that at any point in time, you can reforecast, right? You can basically say, okay, look, we had a change in priorities. We have an additional 10 stories. What's it gonna take us now? What's the range now that if we add 10 stories to this, given what we've already completed, how far does that push us out? And then we can have that important qualitative discussion. Do we either, are we okay with the schedule going out or do we need to cut scope? And so I think, you know, thinking in terms of risk and quality is really the way that we, that our customers think. Um, and while we might not use the exact terms that the tool gives us, that's what we're really talking about is how, how comfortable are you state slipping? Or if we really need this scope, you know, can we, can we cut it? And the day deliver? And those are really the quality questions that we need to answer. Cool. All right. So next one. This is one one that I, I always hear in my in my training classes. How much data do you actually need to be able to start baselining to start be able to use this? You want me to take that one, Heidi? Sure. So you know, I uh, I think I recall what Dan said, but I want to hear. Yeah. yeah. So the the short answer is uh, more is generally better, but you can actually get. Uh, credible outputs, credible forecasts from a Marty Conley simulation with as few as 12 data points. Yeah. Meaning, yeah. let's say a team is working in two week sprints in a scrum methodology. After a sprint, you could use that data to make credible forecasts. The tool itself, when you run Monte Carlo simulations, uses a 10,000 uh, 10, simulation baseline uh, because that's big enough to show that, you know, to show a nice smooth bell curve on your output, but also small enough to run instantaneously. You can bump it up to a million, and what you see is that it takes a little bit longer to run and bell curve gets a little bit smooth, but what you see is that the percentiles shift ever so slightly. And so basically um, after a sprint, you can actually make credible forecasts. And what I really like about that is that it acknowledges that things change, teams change. We might start up a new team and get them, get them up and running and it doesn't take that much time in order to gather these data points to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so even if you have a, a team that's been running for a while and you have a lot of historical data, but the team structure changes or something fundamental changes in how the team is made up or how they move, 
um, all of the tools in actionable agile allow you to shrink or expand the, the forecast uh, source data. So whatever that throughput is, let's say your team gets halved for some reason, you can then start gathering data from when that change happened so that the data you're inputting into your simulation reflects reality. Yeah. So just as a reminder that to have it clear. So if your people are, if you're trying to do calculate um, cycle time estimation, just 12 product backlog items is enough to use that. And you're trying to do um, things like throughput calculations with 12 days of data is enough. Just 12, is that the, no is that, the is that the typical guidance that you give as well, Jose? Yeah, we usually say about 11, um, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. in, in, okay. Is enough. In 11 or 12 items of data, it's enough. You are already, um, you already know enough information to actually forecast. That's a really good question. I think yes, yeah, great important. question. Thanks, thanks for asking uh, that one. The, the fear is usually that we need to have hundreds of data pieces of thousands. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, just 11 is enough to get going. So, yeah. Cool. Indeed. All right, next to the next one. That was a great question. Um, Elon again, you had the first question and close to have one of the last ones. Um, long one, so I'm trying to read this and going along. Um, I struggle with understanding how to answer the question, when will, when will an epic be done? In most cases, an entire epic will never be completed. So one or two, one or two of the stories linked to the epic might never get done, others do. So how do you, how do you answer the question, when will an epic be done? Uh, so I think it, it, that's an exercise in scope. So, uh, you know, an epic is well scoped. And if, if, if there are orphan stories that are never getting done, that's probably a scope issue. Um, the, there's the very real question of whether or not an epic was um, broken up into the right level of stories. So uh, one of the things that you get from looking at aging work is it is taking longer than you it's probably too big and probably needs to be broken up and so i think it's very real to expect that over the life cycle of an epic that the number of stories that you initially put into that epic may grow but if you have stories that are never getting completed um, it's probably a question of scope and whether or not they belong in that epic um, but i you should have some idea of what what a con what an epic constitutes in terms of what the scope is you're delivering and good acceptance criteria to know that you've met that scope and at which point you should be able to close that that epic yeah, that's what i was going to say too you have acceptance criteria for an epic you have acceptance criteria for a story you you have these boundary conditions that connect to scope let's go to the next one I am going to apologize because I'm not sure if I know how to pronounce your name. Um, Signio, um, Zinio, uh, sorry, I can't. <laughs> um, so tickets that are long time in the backlog because um, always something more important is happening or right? something more important comes in. Um, do they increase the, do they increase the lead time um, by quite a lot or do you treat them as noise or, or remove it, or do you remove them from the calculations? And these are tickets that are, oh, I for a long time in the backlog specifically. Yeah. So if they're in the backlog, they, sh you know, if, if you're looking at cycle time as measured by the actionable agile tool, if they're in the backlog, they would not be, have considered to start it, started. So they would not uh, add to your lead. Um, however, backlogs are one of those things that, that are on wish lists of things that may get done in the future. And I'm a big proponent of aggressively pruning your backlog. If something has been sitting in your backlog for six months, delete it. I mean, in the spirit of agile, we, you know, we really should be focusing on the most important thing until it's either done or not the most important thing anymore. And if something is really important and you've removed it from your backlog after it's been sitting there for six months, nine months, a year, if it's really important, it'll come back up. I think um, ultimately it just creates confusion if you have a backlog full of things that you don't know if you're actually going to work on them. And worse, if you spent time grooming a ticket that you may never start, uh, that's work that could be spent on on actual important things that are in progress. Cool. So um, there is one about um, how do you get support with actionable agile. Actionable agile. Um, Harun, um, talk to me later. I'll, I'll give you an answer. Okay, that's too specific. Uh, Corrado, um, 
Um, are we going to share the deck? That's a question for both of you. Um, yeah, obviously, this is, is, yeah, it has been recorded. Yeah, I don't problem with that, yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. well. So we can probably share the deck. Um, so I'm just looking for the time. Maybe let's do one, maybe one more or two. Um, so from Vinod, uh, how did you approach planning horizons, EA beyond three months? Um, so long, long planning horizons. Um, things like multiple program increments or release commitments, no roadmap for last projects. How, how do you approach that kind of forecasting or planning? Do you want to take a shot at that? Do you want me to answer it? Um, well, one of the things, you know, we use an OKR framework to guide uh, a lot of the work that we do. And th this is not something that we've deliberately, at least at this point, connected to that. And we also practice uh, continuous deployment and release multiple times a day. We're focusing more on the smaller releasable items and how to get them through our flow and have a steady flow. It's more of the focus that we take. Yeah, and we're, we're still positioning teams to be able to start using the forecasting tools. Um, but what I would say is that, um, you know, the, the clear guidance that I try to give to teams is that the further out you try to forecast, uh, the less accurate your forecast will be. It's just like trying to estimate knowledge work. It turns out that we are, as human beings, very poor at estimating knowledge work beyond about 16 hours. Um, so if we extrapolate that and say that we are intending to deliver a complex roadmap um, over a three, six, 12 month period, uh, we should expect the further out we go for those estimates to be wildly inaccurate. And, and the level of detail that we're able to give and the level of credibility and certainty that we'll give will drop off dramatically. That said, I mean, a three month window is probably doable for teams once they get disciplined with this. And if they've given enough forethought to at least taking uh, what the large bags of features they're supposed to deliver and breaking them up roughly into the stories they think might constitute those without going into the detail of grooming out those stories, but roughly let's say a big feature takes 25 stories or something like that. At the point that they have that level of detail, they can plug it into this tool and they should get back a pretty credible and confident forecast knowing that scope may increase and that they may have misestimated, but it's certainly better than guessing. And it also tends to be better than even educated guessing. Cool. Okay. Um, we're running out of time. So maybe one more again, this is about uh, probably about um, item size. So have you tried to, to use these techniques for larger, larger item size, I guess, things like uh, forecasting epics or initiatives or, or things like that. Just yeah, so you certainly can forecast epics, but in order to be able to do so, the epics themselves have to move through your workflow stages. So typically the way most teams use epics is that as a bag to hold stories and the stories move through your workflow. If your epics mm -hmm. never move through your workflow, there's no way of accurately calculating the cycle time. But there's mm -hmm. nothing stopping you from doing that. There's, there's absolutely nothing stopping you from doing that. There is a, if I add something, for example, if you were using the concept of flight levels and you had the boards flowing those things, epics or initiatives, then same thing applies. You could do it, but you have to yep. be moving beyond, beyond the story and beyond the, the team level. For that. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do the final question, um, Andrew Flannery. And um, is there accountability for the performance against those metrics? I don't know whether it's a performance of what, but... <laughs> Uh, there is not currently. We, and in fact, Heidi and I have been very, very careful to frame this initiative from the perspective of the teams. So the, what, we are in, what we are attempting to enable teams to do first and foremost is within the team to be able to confidently answer the question, when will it be done? We, we would like teams to be able to know how much work they're able to complete in any given period of time. And from that, once they get that degree of comfort, we'd like them to be able to credibly answer to the rest of the world, especially their stakeholders, when will it be done? Um, we've been mm -hmm. very careful not to tie this to accountability yet. I think they're, you know, they're, they're almost invariably any business will want that level of accountability, uh, but until we can flex that muscle and let teams be confident internally, you know, in being able to answer when will it be done, I think it's unfair to hold them accountable externally. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's um, three minutes to eight. You can see from the fact that I'm becoming like a queen song music, wherever it was. Um, it's very dark <laughs> behind. I <laughs> forgot to put my lights on. So um, I think 
it should be the last question. Um, it's as I say, it's eight o'clock in the UK. So um, I would like to thank you both um, for the excellent session. We have the recording. Uh, we will be sharing it shortly on the meetup group. We have some of the questions that haven't been answered. There were quite too many to answer still. So if I if we can capture them, maybe we try to do a way of um, answering, responding, following up. But yeah. um, thank you very much, Heidi. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you for giving us mm -hmm. your time. Um, to the rest of you, thank you for attending this. Um, keep in touch, there will be more sessions, hopefully as good as this one, um, coming shortly. And stay healthy, stay safe. We'll see you soon. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye now. Be well.